Hey everyone, it's me again, Sam Ashu. Thank you so much for listening. We have a special announcement today. We have reached 500,000 downloads as a podcast, and I am completely overwhelmed by that number. Thank you so much for being a listener and being part of the EB Medicine family. I could not be more proud of what we have accomplished together and what is coming down the pipeline. If you're not already a subscriber, join us at ebmedicine.net and look at all of the exciting things in medical education that we have available for you. It is a momentous occasion for the podcast, and I'm so happy you're here to join us. And I just want to say thanks. It's been a great, great time for me personally being on the podcast, and I'm so happy that so many of you have found it helpful and hopefully will continue to do so in the future. And now, let's dive into today's podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. It is me, Sam Eshu, and my friend on the other side of the microphone. Dr. G.R. Eckler, excited to be back again for another life-altering podcast. Today, we are talking about the September 2023 Emergency Medicine Practice article on rectal bleeding. This particular article was authored by Dr. Von Schweinitz and Dr. Pinkston. Both of them did an outstanding job with the literature review, starting at over 10,000 results, looking at lots of societal guidelines and narrowing it all down for us into this wonderfully published article. I think they did a really good job, honestly. And I dare say I learned something after 20 plus years of practice from reading this article. I think this is such an important topic because it's something that so often it's not dangerous, but the times that it is... It's not easy to catch, and you've got to keep that high index of suspicion that there's cases like these that are trying to sneak by you every day, and if you stay sharp, you're going to catch them. Isn't that just like the definition of emergency medicine? Most people are going to be fine, except the ones that aren't, and those are the ones you hope you're going to catch. (laughs) And I feel like some of it, it's clear, like we get our EKGs and our troponins, and I feel like it's a little easier to catch the heart attacks. I feel like going through this article, I was reassured by the fact that these are not easy to catch and the tests that we have like a fecal occult blood test aren't always the best so the things that you need to just keep in your mind about looking at each patient and saying all right where is my gestalt on this i felt like that reassured me that's what you've got to go with and just keep sharp and and make sure you know what you should be looking for yeah Interestingly, one out of every thousand emergency department visits has to do with rectal bleeding, and this article doesn't just cover adults. There was a pretty significant discussion here about pediatric rectal bleeding, which is a whole nother differential. So kudos to these authors for being brave enough to tackle both the adult and pediatric presentations and include all of that in our differential. It's really a very well-written article. The Introduction section alone addresses all of the different potential etiologies in children and in adults and does a pretty good job, I think, of laying out the landscape for where we have been when we talk about upper GI bleeding versus lower GI bleeding versus bleeding in children. And we think about in those broad categories, the upper GI bleeding being people who come in either vomiting blood or are passing black stool, the lower GI bleeding being people who are passing bright red blood through the rectum and not vomiting or having any upper abdominal pain necessarily. And then the pediatric population we'll get into in a few minutes. And in the nomenclature, in the historical definitions, it all has to do with what we think is the attachment point there of the ligament of trites. So the anatomical ligamentous attachment to the duodenum Anything proximal to that being defined as an upper GI bleed and anything distal to that being defined as a lower GI bleed. But honestly, I'm not so sure that anatomical difference really matters anymore. And clinically, it's are you vomiting blood? Are you passing black stools? Or are you having bright red blood per rectum? And even that differentiation, honestly, if you've got a brisk enough upper GI bleed, you're going to be passing bright red blood per rectum with some melanin. So It's not a 100% differentiator, but that's the general broad categories of how we think about it. I think it just comes down to taking the best history you can and then trying to decide which end the camera has to go in first, because I think that's the whole game. And then there is this whole population of people who have 
other pathologies, things like inflammatory bowel diseases. And so all of that is covered here. It's a lot of things to tackle at once, but I think they did a really good job of walking us through it from the emergency medicine perspective. The differential diagnosis for all things rectal bleeding is beautifully listed there in table one, and they actually went the extra step of detailing the typical life-threatening causes and ones that would be non-life-threatening in both adults and children. So if you're dealing with an adult with rectal bleeding, look at this list and make sure you've addressed all of this in your brain. And if you're dealing with a child with rectal bleeding, take a look at those diagnoses. It's everything from esophageal varices, peptic ulcer disease, diverticular disease, aortoenteric fistulas, and mesenteric ischemia for the life-threatening ones in adults, the benign ones in adults, anal fissures, hemorrhoids, abscesses, cancers. So benign in, in the sense that it's not immediately life-threatening, but not that it's not important. Post-radiation syndrome, foreign bodies, Mallory Weiss tears, infections. And then in the child population, the more life-threatening ones would be things like intussusceptions, midgut volvulus, necrotizing enterocolitis, especially in the newborns, hemolytic uremic syndrome and Hirschsprung disease, and then some of the more benign etiologies like protein allergies and Meckel's diverticula and henox shoreline purpura, anal fissures, hemorrhoids, all of these kinds of things. There's a lot in here, and it's all packed into this one table very succinctly. I really like that one. Also, there are two other tables immediately afterwards. One is table two, which lists the medications and toxins associated with rectal bleeding, things like anticoagulants, antiplatelet medications, and caustic agents. So if you're dealing with someone who has had a sodium hydroxide ingestion, sulfuric acid ingestion, ammonia ingestion, or is on one of the very many anticoagulants that are currently available, that's primarily the things that are associated with bleeding. And then table three, some rectal bleeding mimics. If you had a recent ingestion of red fruit, bismuth, iron, gelatin, or food dyes, or charcoal, all of those can alter the color of your stool and may lead you to think that someone is bleeding when they're actually not. I find that the charcoal didn't surprise people as much because their stool came out black, but they generally knew they were taking charcoal. I find that Pepto-Bismol always surprises people because they're always amazed that it goes from pink to black when it comes through them. And I always try to tell people to, to make sure not to come rushing back to the ER just because they took Pepto-Bismol and things got dark after that. I've never actually looked. Does it say on the bottle that this will turn your stool black? Very much. So. It does. Oh, okay. See, I learned something again just now. <laughs> but you've got to unfold and then unfold the wrapper on the <laughs> That's bottle right. to be That's able right. to read that. It's the third well. page of the <laughs> insert on the back of the bottle, but it is on there somewhere. Okay, pre-hospital care. For if you're one of our pre-hospital colleagues and you've got someone with rectal bleeding and you're transporting them to the emergency department, are there things you should keep in mind? This was a very interesting section to me. There is discussion of the shock index in the trauma literature. I haven't yeah. really considered it in the cases of GI bleeding. And the authors of the article specifically mention the age-adjusted shock index as a marker for badness. So your shock index is your heart rate divided by your systolic blood pressure. You can modify it and take heart rate divided by mean arterial pressure, or you can age adjust it, which is your shock index multiplied by your age. And that can be a calculation, maybe not so quick calculation, depending on how old the patient is, but that can be something you can calculate to try and get an idea of how sick the person is in front of you if you are in a pre-hospital setting where you have choices about where you're taking someone and there happens to be a difference in the facilities you might choose and one of them specifically has GI services or perhaps interventional radiology services, people who are capable of doing things like embolizations, then that I think is when this starts to matter. Or if you are in for example, air transport, and you're taking someone to another hospital, and you've got some choices, then if someone has a particularly severe shock index, they're having very brisk bleeding, or they're high risk, then this might actually make a difference about which facility you take them to. Otherwise, the initial resuscitation in the pre-hospital care area is really the same. You're placing IVs, you're starting fluid resuscitation, and then you're getting them to the hospital as quickly as possible. There is some evidence that 
people who are considered to be low risk, so not a lot of comorbid medical conditions, not in the extremes of age, so not newborn and not geriatric, very old, tipping the scales. Those kinds of people who are not on anticoagulants and don't have a lot of medical history can probably be managed at most community centers. So if you are in the process of deciding, do I need to drive this person out of the community to a tertiary center, or can I take them to the local emergency department? There is some evidence that supports that decision you're going to make, that if they're relatively low risk with a relatively benign presentation, that's someone you can take to your local center, and they can get their complaints addressed there. I think having come from the rural places in my first job, this is a challenging discussion to have. I think when you know some of these patients and you can, you are aware that this is an alcoholic who's got really bad varices. This is a patient we already know has cancer or had just had aortic surgery. Like there are things that can tip this that you want to transport them by helicopter. But I think a lot of times getting them somewhere where they can get blood and get imaging and get some things figured out is probably the first step because you can stabilize them somewhat to get them to that next step in a lot of cases. But I think that there's always room for to go case by case for this. And I think that's pretty important. When it comes to the shock index, 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 is normal. I wanted to look that up because I wanted to have it in my head. So anything above 0 0.7 should start to raise your suspicion, especially over one. And then I think if you can age adjust that, this is especially something that I'm going to start looking at in my, my more elderly patients. One of my, my co-residents gave a great talk on this in residency, and it still sticks in my head that you need to be very cautious about older people that are showing you signs of shock because they have so much less of an ability to compensate. It's really important to be more aggressive and more thorough in your workup of these people because there's something there that, that you need to find. Yeah, great points. And then once they make it to the emergency department and we're talking about obtaining a history, again, two categories of patients. For the adult, the history focuses on a lot of questions. Things like, do they have a prior history of any GI disease like cirrhosis or diverticulitis or inflammatory bowel disease? All of their surgical history, especially anything that's aortic in etiology or manipulation of the aorta, their prior colonoscopy history, and then do they have other medical problems like atrial fibrillation or prosthetic heart valves? Are they anticoagulated? What medications do they take? Our gastroenterology colleagues are always asking about things like NSAID use, immunosuppression. Are they currently on chemo? Do they have a history of alcohol use, IV drug use? What's their viral hepatitis history or predispositions? Have they had significant unintentional weight loss recently? Has the rectal bleeding been going on for a while? Is there any history of cancer? Are they having any associated pain? Uh, and if they are having pain, where is that pain? Is it in the rectal area? Is it in the anal area? Do they have a history of hemorrhoids? The number of questions you should ask is pretty large when you're talking to an adult who's just undifferentiated rectal bleeding. Can I tell you one area that always impresses me? Go Patients for it. recall so few of their diagnostic tests or who did their surgeries but they always really have a good sense of what was on their upper GI scope or what was on their colonoscopy. Like I find that their recollection of what the report says for that is usually pretty good. So I find that I almost always ask them like, when was your last upper scope? When was your last colonoscopy? And they give you a pretty good idea of what's going on. And I think that can tend to guide you in a, in a pretty reasonable direction with the idea being that always the sickest one will tell you that everything was fine last time. I'm a hundred percent convinced that is all due to the bowel prep. Wow. And that it's just so terrible that you will recall everything and anything surrounding that bowel prep. Like, when do you have to do it again? Why did you have to do it? What were the results? Just so that you don't have to do it again or do it less frequently than anyone else might suggest. Because if it's just a scan, you're like, yeah, I had a scan. I don't know. At some point they found something. I have to get a follow-up scan. But if I have to drink that stuff and do that again anytime in the next 10 years, you better believe I'm going to remember everything and anything about that procedure so that we don't have to go through that again. There's no way I'm losing that record. Interesting. That's a good deep thought. I like that. For children, now, if you're on the other extreme, 
and you're examining a child and trying to get a history from the parents about rectal bleeding, then it's important to know that if they're a neonate, so if they're within that first 28 days of life, you've got to ask for things like prematurity, low birth weight. Was there anything suggesting necrotizing enterocolitis associated with that prematurity or at birth? Are they at increased risk for Hirschsprung's disease? Do they have Down syndrome? And in the slightly older pediatric population, you have to entertain other diagnoses like intussusception, which is classically described as current jelly stools with this intermittent colicky abdominal pain for presentation. And then when you flip to the physical examination, there isn't a whole lot here that's going to help you. Obviously, vital signs and how do they appear? Are they ill or toxic, especially in the pediatric population? The general gestalt of how they appear is important. You are going to focus on things like abdominal tenderness or palpation of masses. You are going to be looking for things like pallor, jaundice, what their conjunctiva look like to suggest things like severe anemia. And then you're going to take a look at that anal area. And this is interesting. In the article, the authors describe all the things you should look for on physical examination to help you rule things out on your differential diagnosis. So you're looking for external hemorrhoids, you're looking for anal fissures, you're looking for signs of trauma. Interestingly, there isn't a whole lot of literature backing up the utility of the occult blood test. Now, although there isn't a whole lot of literature backing that up, I still personally find this to be a helpful test. However, the authors make the specific point that so far, in the evidence that we have, the occult blood tests don't have a very good positive or negative predictive value. And so you can get false positives and you can get false negatives. So although you may perform one of these tests, you can't be 100% reliant on that and you need to do a good history and a physical examination. They also drive home the point that you shouldn't skip that anal examination because you may be able to tell what the etiology for the bleeding is without having to do things like blood testing or advanced imaging. And if you're dealing with a pediatric patient or someone who's young and healthy and maybe doesn't really need much else other than an examination, that's an important point because that can decrease all of the testing you're going to order and all the radiation you're going to expose this person to. I think my big takeaway from this whole section on physical exam was just that you need to be careful and you need to get as much data as you can you know that fecal occult blood test isn't going to necessarily push you one way or the other, but I think it helps you put together all the pieces of a pretty challenging puzzle. And I think the more data you can get from each of these patients, the more you're going to be able to put together what this diagnosis is. There are some good pictures there of what typical hemorrhoids look like when they're thrombosed and non-thrombosed and what fissures look like. Interestingly, fissures can be located in the midline and they can be located laterally. And if they're located laterally, they're actually associated with other disease processes like HIV, syphilis, tuberculosis, malignancies, or inflammatory bowel disease. So even right. just that physical exam finding can be very helpful in elucidating the answer for the rectal bleeding presentation. And then there is also this mantra in medicine that digital rectal examination in the immunocompromised patient is contraindicated because you can perhaps make them back to remake by performing the rectal examination. And there isn't much good evidence to back that up. There was one study cited in the article. It was only 40 patients, but there were 40 patients with neutropenia who underwent rectal examination, and there was no increased risk of bacteremia in that population. That's not a very large study, but it is some evidence at least that suggests that mantra may not actually be true. Interestingly, the article itself suggests that just even visual anal examination will help you identify most of these things. And so you don't have to go probing that area very much if you can just see and locate the answer immediately, like it's an external hemorrhoid or a fissure. And then when it comes to laboratory testing, again, it matters if they're a well appearing young adult a well-appearing child, or an ill-appearing geriatric patient. The laboratory testing for adult patients who are perhaps higher risk or in that geriatric population includes things that we normally think about. So you're going to get your CBC, you're going to look for anemias. If they're on anticoagulants, you're going to do coagulation studies, perhaps type and cross for blood if they're having significant bleeding or any kind of instability. You're looking for liver or hepatic testing. Cardiac markers, maybe if there's concern for ischemia, 
Lactic acid is actually studied more in sepsis, but there is some literature to suggest that even in the pediatric population, this elevated lactic acid in the setting of intussusception might actually be a high-risk scenario. And then inflammatory markers like the CRP have some benefit for patients who have long-term management problems with inflammatory bowel disease, but not really a role acutely in the emergency medicine evaluation. I had two thoughts on this. One, I thought that the lactic acid was valuable because I find that often I'm using this to try to catch like a mesenteric ischemia, especially when you have that exam where the pain is out of proportion to their exam and they're older. I think that and your CT can help you put the pieces together in that kind of condition. And I also think that now we're seeing more and more in patients with hemorrhagic diarrhea that you can do a stool culture and our new stool cultures with the, the technology we have and in the PCR we can do, you can get a sense of, is that E. coli? Is it Shigella? And I think that really helps guide your treatment in the right way. So I think for some of these younger patients, if they have hemorrhagic diarrhea, I'm more inclined if I've got that in my ER that is an available test, I'm more inclined to really try to get them to give me a stool sample. And if not, to send them home with a cup to say, all right, if we keep having bloody stools, then let's think about getting this test to figure out what it is. Again, another excellent point. When it comes to imaging studies, there is very little evidence that plain films are really of any utility. That's the, the basic bottom line for routine x-ray imaging. Plain films are historically reserved for infants to help rule in life-threatening etiologies like malrotation or necrotizing enterocolitis. They're inexpensive, but the yield there is just not very good. And when we're talking about adults, it's even worse. And people obtain things like upright and supine abdominal x-rays and things like upright chest x-rays to look for free air under the diaphragm. If you're there with somebody who's clinically unstable, they have peritonitis, uh, then sure, that can be a very quick study to do at the bedside as opposed to having to send them to CT, especially if your CT is not in the department. But in general, you're going to get very little information, if any, from a plain film. Then there is newer evidence now with the improvement of computed tomography or CT technology that CT angiography is actually helpful in the adult population presenting with rectal bleeding. The evidence says that CT angiography can detect bleeding as little as 0.3 milliliters per hour, which actually surprised me. That's like a tiny little drop of blood per hour that can be actually picked up by CT angiography. And that's typically a three-sequence or a three-phased study where you get a non-contrast scan, then you get the IV contrast and get another scan, and then you get delayed images, and you're looking for that IV contrast extravasation somewhere in the colon. It is currently listed as a recommendation from the American College of Radiology as a study that can be obtained in the management of patients presenting with lower gastrointestinal tract bleeding. And that's as of 2021. So if you're at a facility that's capable of performing CT angiography and you're dealing with someone with lower GI bleeding, an adult who is stable or at least stable enough to make it to the CT scanner, this study can actually be of some utility. And if the bleeding is brisk enough, then you can go down the pathway of interventional radiology or potential arterial embolization, which ultimately is going to give you some bowel ischemia. So you do have to keep that in the back of your mind. But if you're at a facility that has those services available, then that's a conversation you need to have with your interventional colleagues and your gastroenterologist, because traditional colonoscopy requires a prep, and even the most urgent of colonoscopies is going to require at least an eight-hour prep. So it's not an immediate method of stopping that bleeding, especially if it's brisk. I don't know what your practice is, but honestly, I can't say I've incorporated CT angiography into my lower GI bleeding patients. And this article made me pause and think that perhaps there is a, a role for that in my evaluation of this patient population. Not that I need an excuse to order more CT scans, but in this particular case, yeah, it does seem like there is some evidence there that this can be a helpful study in that lower GI bleeding patient population. I think the nuance for me is if it's new bleeding, like they've never bled before, if I don't know where it's coming from, 
if they're on anticoagulation, if they're older, or if they're unstable. If there's something that makes me think, I need to figure this out now, I can't wait until the morning. I think that's where the nuance for me is, that I'm more inclined to put them in the CT scanner. And I, I read a recent study that said that the more we communicate to radiology, that we're looking for a bleed, upper or lower where it is. So I really, if I'm doing that, I try to comment in my order, hey, I really think this is an upper GI bleed. I really think this is a lower GI bleed. And then I let them adjust accordingly for their timing. Fantastic. There was a good discussion there about ultrasound as well. And again, if you're dealing with the pediatric population and you're considering something like intussusception, this is one of the primary methods of finding that. If you have one available to you and you're trained in point-of-care ultrasonography, there's good evidence that in the hands of trained emergency physicians, we are adept at identifying intussusception, but it can also give you additional information. You can get a quick image of kidneys and bladder and in the adult population, you can get a quick image of their aorta. So if it's significant bleeding and they have aortic pathology, that raises your concern for aortoenteric fistulas as a possible cause for the bleeding. So there is a role for point-of-care ultrasound, and if you have it available to you, there is certainly a utility to it. There also is this test called a red blood cell scintigraphy scan. This is a nuclear medicine test with tagged red blood cells looking for extravasation of these blood cells into the colon. It is something we actually used to do a long time ago inpatient, in the hospital setting, not in the emergency department for people who we've been unable to find a cause for bleeding or persistent anemia who have undergone colonoscopy and it was just non-diagnostic. So there is a role for this, although I think, honestly, this is probably going to go by the wayside as more and more CT angiography studies are ordered. It's a more time-consuming test, the red blood cell scintigraphy test, so not necessarily pertinent to the emergency department. And then there's a discussion there about anoscopy and what you can obtain from that kind of examination. And again, that's not something I think we're going to be doing in the emergency department, but it's good to mention that's something your surgical colleagues might be considering. It is generally more painful and may require some kind of sedation or anxiolysis for the patients, just something to keep in mind, especially if they're unstable. There are some great pictures. Figure 7 has a great view of that target donut sign, what you might see on ultrasound for an intussusception. Figure 6 shows you what contrast extravasation looks like on CT angiography with bleeding into the right hemicolon. And I found those images to be very helpful because sometimes you're the first person to lay eyes on these pictures and the radiologist isn't going to be available for a little while. And so you can recognize these. I had one other thing that, that I wanted to note that it didn't seem like there was any benefit of giving these people oral contrast. And I feel like there was a time in my practice in the last 10 years where radiologists were encouraging me to give my GI bleed some oral contrast to help them see things. So I think this kind of fits with my current model of practice that I want to give them IB, and I don't really want to give them anything PO if I don't have to. Yeah, that's an excellent point, actually. The oral contrast can make things worse for you if you're going to order a CT angiography study because you're looking to see where it's extravasating into the GI tract, and if it's filled with oral contrast, you're not going to see that. So in this particular instance, that's a great point to make. We don't give that anymore. And then NG tubes, back when I was a resident in the Stone Age, they— we. People used to get NG tubes and lavage of their stomach to look for bright red blood to prove this was an upper GI bleed. The evidence doesn't really support doing that. The predictive value of that test is very low, and it's exceedingly uncomfortable for patients. And it doesn't alter the need for endoscopic intervention to look for culprit lesions. So that's just something we don't do anymore. It's interesting. There was one stipulation, and that's that people who are undergoing urgent bowel preparation may need an NG tube to get all of the bowel prep in. Yes, to get all of the bowel prep in. And I, honestly, I cannot think of a worse scenario when you're critically ill and in need of an emergent test or emergent treatment that someone would come to you with a giant bottle of bowel prep and say, either you're going to drink this or we're going to take this garden hose and shove it down your nose and into your stomach and then pour it into your stomach. I'm really not sure which is worse in that scenario, but that might be the only scenario where you might need an NG2. I, I would like to take a 10-second pause and advocate for the Eckler NG tube 
management protocol, which is where you give the patient some viscous lidocaine to gargle. Then you give them a lidocaine nebulizer treatment, and then you spray a little hurricane spray in the back of their throat. Because if someone was going to put a garden hose in your nose, you would want to have all of that done, plus maybe a little viscous lidocaine on the tube before it went into your nose, because you want to be as pain-free as possible before that thing goes in. And maybe also consider giving them a little dose of pain medication before they get it, like a little fentanyl, a little morphine, because man, those things hurt. And you should really try to make people as comfortable as possible before you're going to put an NG tube in. Nice. That's a lot of lidocaine. Lidocaine in the nose, lidocaine nebulized, and lidocaine gargles. Sam, I don't want to feel that thing go from my nose to my stomach. I, I just not. don't. No, and neither do you. I, I would actually take the risk of uh, some kind of arrhythmia from lidocaine toxicity in that scenario and just be like, just keep it coming. Just keep it coming. You got any IV lidocaine? Let's go. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> We're not doing that. But yes, we do. <laughs> colonoscopies. So yes, colonoscopies are a diagnostic study. So they're in here. The American College of Gastroenterologists recommends against unprepped colonoscopy, which is no surprise. If you're going to put a camera into a lumen and there is debris in the lumen and you're not going to be able to see the walls, there is no utility to that study. If someone needs an emergent colonoscopy, it's going to take about eight hours for some of that prep to actually get in there and clean the colon so that your endoscopist can actually do something. And the colonoscopy unprepped is really just about useless in that scenario, other than maybe the perianal or proctoscope imaging. Otherwise, the rest of it is not going to be of any utility. Interestingly, urgent colonoscopy is thought of as being about a 12-hour window. Emergent colonoscopy is about that eight-hour window. And then routine colonoscopy for someone who's stable is recommended within 24 hours of admission. I just thought it was worth noting that for colonoscopies, when you're looking at admitting these people and, and you wonder, do those studies end up being positive or not? They, they quoted a 2017 study that showed 509 patients who underwent colonoscopy for a suspected lower GI bleed. Only 27 had a non-diagnostic study. So I think that when you're worried about people, when they're older, when they're a little unstable, when they're higher risk, this is a good thing to keep them in the hospital for because if you can get it within 24 hours, they're going to get some answers. Yeah, exactly. And... There actually was another citation in this section. It talks about the British Society of Gastroenterology guidelines, which say if you make it into the hospital for lower GI bleeding but don't undergo colonoscopy, that it's recommended you do within two weeks because there's a 5% likelihood of picking up a colorectal cancer in this population. This is in patients who are older than 50 and discharged from the hospital. In the U.S., though, I think the common practice is colonoscopy within 24 hours. So hopefully just an observation stay for most people. Well, when it comes to treatment, we've got several options uh, for resuscitation and blood transfusion. There has been a significant amount of evidence in the past few years that a conservative strategy to transfusions is best, especially in the GI bleeding population. Uh, a, a threshold 7 for hemoglobin is recommended based on a, a landmark study by Villanueva et al., where 921 patients with upper GI bleeding were evaluated. And when compared to a target of nine for hemoglobin, the restrictive group had improved survival at six weeks and an 8% reduction in adverse events, mainly pulmonary edema. And transfusing to a threshold of seven in that scenario is better for patients than actually giving them more blood unless, and this is an important caveat, unless they had high-risk medical comorbidities, things like coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, those things actually put them at a higher risk group. And so you might find that your inpatient colleagues are transfusing those patients up to a hemoglobin threshold of nine if they have severe coronary disease or other cardiovascular risk factors. So that's just an important caveat to keep in mind, but otherwise transfuse to a hemoglobin of seven. My caveat to that caveat is if they're unstable, if their pressure's low, if they're tacky, I think it's reasonable to lead with blood and see if they respond. And then I, I want you to be rechecking labs a little more quickly. I don't think you're waiting for a four-hour hemoglobin on those people. You want to check it at two hours or something like that, even one hour if you're really concerned, because I think that's going to give you a better indicator of where they're at and what's really going on. But I think you got to be reasonable and try to 
be a little more cautious in most of these GI bleed, but if they're unstable, you got to be more, more inclined to lead with blood because they can run out of blood in the tank. Yeah, that's a great point. We know from the trauma literature that it takes a while for your hemoglobin to drop in acute blood loss, and that's no different in GI bleeding. And so if you're dealing with someone who's hemodynamically unstable with acute blood loss, you're not reliant on that hemoglobin to give you an accurate measure of how full their tank is. And so emergent blood transfusion is still indicated in that scenario. Also, unlike the trauma population, we don't have any good evidence about crystalloid infusion. So it is actually okay for someone who is hypotensive to start with some crystalloid and then look at their response, but have a low threshold for moving on to blood products. Can I cover just the simple points of treatment that I found really interesting? Don't reverse their anticoagulation. Don't transfuse them with platelets. And... Go ahead and embolize them if they need to be embolized, but you'll know it from your CT. There you go. There's the summary. There are multiple things available to us these days to reverse anticoagulation. If they're on warfarin, you can give them the prothrombin complex concentrate or the four-factor 4-FPCC. You can give them FFP if you don't have that around. If they're on one of the direct oral anticoagulants, we've got a pixaban. If they're on... The bigger trend, you've got the reversal agent for that, which is unpronounceable. <laughs> and all of these things might be available in your pharmacy, but in general, the American College of Gastroenterology is not recommending them in patients who are anticoagulated, especially if the last dose was more than 24 hours ago. Same with platelet transfusions. We're looking at a level somewhere around 50,000. So if their level is that or higher, it's not recommended you give them platelets. Embolization, like you mentioned, if it's available to you, is an option. That's typically somebody who's got active extravasation you can see on a CT scan so that your interventionalist knows where they're going to try to embolize. Tranexamic acid has been studied in the GI population. And the study here actually randomized greater than 12,000 patients who were GI bleeding into receiving either placebo or the typical dose of TXA, one gram over 10 minutes, followed by three grams over 24 hours. And fortunately, it did not show any utility in GI bleeding. And so we're not giving it there either. There is evidence that in upper GI bleeding, antibiotics are helpful, but not in lower GI bleeding. So although we commonly give it, or I've seen it given in lower GI bleeding, the evidence supports its use in upper GI bleeding due to variceal bleeding. I mean, we're giving those people ceftriaxone, Sam. Is that what you're giving them to? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's relatively easy and it's very available to us in the emergency department. It's going to be either that or some kind of penicillin-based antibiotic, zosin or something of that sort. And then if you're dealing with somebody who has inflammatory bowel disease, there is immunosuppression. Now, in the era of biologics, some of these people are already getting long-term therapy that can do a very good job in controlling their disease. But in the acute flare, steroids might be recommended. That's typically done in consultation with your gastroenterologist, along with aminosalicylates or that 5-ASA. There is a Cochrane Library published review. Uh, that said that 5-ASA is not helpful in the prevention of diverticulitis, not really surprising there, but it can be useful in inflammatory bowel disease. So a conversation to have with your gastroenterologist about how severe this particular flare is and what the plan is going to be with this patient. And then there is just minor therapy. We don't have to get into this, but obviously if they're dealing with hemorrhoids, there are sitz baths and topical medications and hydrocortisone and increasing fiber in their diet. Surgical excision got the thumbs down in the article. And yeah. honestly, I was happy to see that. I am not a fan of excising hemorrhoids. No. And if they are within that 72-hour window and you're in an emergency department where you have the luxury of doing these kinds of procedures and in infinite amounts of time, then yeah, sure, it can be helpful. Use an abundant amount of local anesthetic and make that elliptical incision and excise that clot. But in general, these people can follow up as an outpatient with symptomatic care with your colorectal surgeon. Two questions, Sam. Do you put Epsom salts in your SIPS baths or no salts in your SIPS baths? I am ambivalent to it. I just tell people if it helps, they could try it, but I don't particularly have a strong feeling. What do you do? I, I, I do the same thing. I tell them to start with water, and if they want to try some Epsom salts, they can. Or if their provider is, whether it's OB or surgery, has told them to go one way or the other, 
I tend to go with that, but I'm just, it's one of those things that I'm always intrigued by because I feel like there's two camps. It's almost like LR and NS. You're either doing it or you're not. And if you're not, you're wrong. Yeah, well, I'm too lazy. I'm riding that line. <laughs> the better question, did you know what a flea batonic was? I did not. I was impressed that there was a Cochrane review showing that these flea batonics are very beneficial to treating hemorrhoids and other things. And I need to go and do more research on it because it seems like there's a lot of different plant-derived things that I don't quite know exactly what I should be using these for. So I, it's going to be a further deep dive for me. Yeah, that's an interesting category of medication that's actually doesn't have a prescription available in the United States. So that it would be like some over-the-counter medication for hemorrhoid treatment. What has actually shown promise as far as evidence is concerned would be something like topical nifedipine or even topical nitroglycerin in severe cases for anal fissures. And so nifedipine can be used for hemorrhoids. Nitroglycerin can be used for fissures increasing fiber, topical hydrocortisone, which is available without a prescription over-the-counter, can help with hemorrhoidal itching and, and symptoms as well, and lots of over-the-counter therapies. But no, I had not heard of flebotonics before reading this article. That's a great question. Most everybody's getting Metamucil and some topical steroid for their posterior for me. That's what I think is a reasonable place to start. There you go. And since this is such a robust review of all things rectal bleeding, there are some special populations we need to talk about. First are the pediatric patients. So when you're assessing pediatric patients with rectal bleeding, especially in the first few months of life, we typically think about that being an inpatient evaluation for life-threatening causes. The GI bleeding in this population is really focused around birth history, prematurity, and whether or not this is maternal blood that could have passed through with breastfeeding and the apt test exists for that. Looking for anal fissures in childhood is helpful. In the infant population, this is associated with non-accidental trauma. In the older child, so older than two years old, this can be associated with toilet training. An important distinction you've got to keep in mind. Keeping intussusception in your differential is important along with Meckel's diverticula, which are not common, but an important item to recognize on your differential. And then HSP or henox line purpura, which is self-limiting, but is a vasculitis that can give you GI bleeding and sometimes nephropathy. And examining the children, making sure you're aware of which age category they're in and trying to differentiate normal findings in one age category with findings of non-accidental trauma in the other age category is a critical differentiation when you're talking about this age group. So keep in mind the neonate versus the toddler when you're talking about these diagnoses. Pregnant patients, as with all things, pregnancy is a risk factor for so many things, but obviously hemorrhoidal disease can certainly occur Rectal bleeding can certainly occur if they have a history of inflammatory bowel disease. That can certainly flare as well, and that is going to be heavily reliant on your GI and OB colleagues to come up with a treatment plan. Pregnant patients can also suffer from pelvic floor dysfunction and have increased rates of fissures as well, and so physical therapy can actually be helpful in this particular instance where pelvic floor muscle exercises can help with some of that symptomatic treatment. Mm -hmm. And then in the elderly, so we talked about the extremes of age have a, a very high suspicion in the neonates and a very high suspicion in the elderly. We were talking about age over 65 have a much higher associated risk of life-threatening bleeding, especially if they're on anticoagulants or have multiple medical problems. So recurrent GI bleeding associated with things like aortic stenosis, angiodysplasia, von Willebrand syndrome and other medical problems, all of these put these patients at very high risk. There is this triad, I think it's pronounced Hedy syndrome, where uh, aortic stenosis and angiodysplasia and acquired von Willebrand syndrome come together, and actually correction of their aortic stenosis will relieve the problem, but this can be associated with GI bleeding. So just one more thing to keep in mind when we're talking about our geriatric population, and it becomes a problem when you're talking about disposition because you've got stable patients and unstable patients. That's an easy differentiator. But what about the ones in between? Maybe they have some risk factors, but they're stable. 
Are there some risk scoring systems that have been proven to be helpful? And I think the authors did an outstanding job of addressing this as well. The Glasgow Blatchford score or GBS score has been proven to be helpful in upper GI bleeding, and that's detailed nicely on table seven. And it takes into account your blood urea level, your hemoglobin, and your systolic blood pressure and calculates a score for you, which can help in risk stratifying that patient. And if they're lower GI bleeding, the authors found the Oakland score to actually be the most helpful after reviewing several of them. The most important thing to keep in mind is that a low Oakland score might support your decision to send someone home. It's not going to decide for you who needs to be admitted, and none of these scores supplant your gestalt and your clinical impression. This is more supporting your decision than it is making your decision. So that's an important differentiator there. The Oakland score takes into account their age, their sex, what you found on digital rectal exam, the heart rate, their blood pressure, their hemoglobin, and their prior GI bleeding history and calculates a number for you. Both of those things are actually available in MD Calc, so I don't recommend committing either of those to memory. You can pull those up and calculate them on your mobile device. In summary, five things that will change your practice. I liked all these, but I thought that this really summarizes everything you need from this article. Make sure you perform an anal examination on all patients presenting with rectal bleeding. Hemorrhoids and anal fissures are a common cause of this chief complaint. And if that's all it is and they're young and healthy, you can stop right there. There's no need to do a further workup. Don't rely on tenderness to palpation on abdominal exam for patients at extremes of age, those with neurologic diseases such as MS, or patients with a history of a spinal cord injury, so have a higher index of suspicion for them. Consider a CT angiogram for patients who present with ongoing rectal bleeding without an obvious source. Avoid fecal occult blood tests to evaluate for rectal bleeding. There's too many false positives and false negatives. So you're trying to save those for people that you're bringing in or for someone that, that it really is going to need to be a part of their workup to advance what's going on. And while risk scores should not replace your clinician judgment, risk scoring systems such as the Oakland score or the others that we discussed, like an age-adjusted shock index, can really help you identify high risk and low risk patients and give you a sense of who you really need to be worried about versus who can safely go home. Yeah, that's excellent. Some of the strategies that they recommend in the article included things like a multidisciplinary policy or team at your hospital. If you can get your GI colleagues and your interventional radiologist or whoever's going to be doing that embolization to come together and decide on a strategy, it is so much better to do that in advance than to have to try and figure it out at midnight on a Saturday night. And then don't forget that transfusion threshold. There's a lot of push from blood banks all over the country that you shouldn't be giving people blood if their hemoglobin's above seven. Again, remember the caveats. People who are elderly and have multiple comorbidities, especially coronary disease, and those who are actively bleeding and in shock right in front of you, it's going to take a while for that hemoglobin to dilute, and those people are going to need rapid resuscitation with blood products. Otherwise, I thought it was an outstanding article. Thanks again to our writers, Dr. Von Schweinitz and Dr. Pinkston. It's a thorough review, and again, it's very challenging to cover both the adult and pediatric presentations of anything in one article. I thought they did an outstanding job. And that's it for today. TR, thanks so much for joining me again. It was a pleasure, as always. Stay sharp out there, kids. And don't forget, every single one of our articles comes with a clinical pathway that is then converted into the interactive version and is available to you on the website and soon in the mobile app. So this one also comes with the clinical pathway for rectal bleeding, which will help walk you through the decisions that we talked about today and also introduce you to some of those clinical risk scores and when an appropriate time to use them might be. Another good tool that's included in your subscription. If you don't have one, consider going and subscribing at eb medicine.net. Until next time, everybody, be safe.